from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Victoria Hill, Acting Chief of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division. On behalf of HSS and the Library of Congress, I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's talk on the Fortune Cookie Chronicles by Jennifer Eight Lee. This lecture is part of our ongoing series of programs in the humanities and social sciences, and we're delighted that the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress and the Asian Division Friends Society have joined us in co-sponsoring this program today. I would like to thank a few people because these programs don't just instantaneously happen. I'd like to thank Abby Yokelson, Maine Reading Room Reference Specialist in English Literature, and I'll let her explain how English Literature, Chinese, how that all combines. She suggested Ms. Lee as a speaker and coordinated the details which made this talk possible. She was assisted by Kathy Woodrell, who designed our flyer. I hope you noticed all the little clever things in it. And Sheridan Harvey and Cheryl Adams, of HSS and Reme Grafalda of the Asian Division. And a special thanks to the sales shop for coordinating the sale of Ms. Lee's books, which are outside and will be available after the program. Special events for all the technical planning and to ITS for webcasting. And speaking of webcasting, please be aware that the entire program, including the question and answer period, is being taped by the Library of Congress. By asking a question, you are implicitly giving permission for the Library of Congress to broadcast your participation. The podcast will be available on the library's webpage at www.loc.gov, and on the lower left-hand side is a link for podcasts. I also encourage all of you to visit the library's webpage and click on researchers to visit the main reading room, local history, microform, and the other 20 reading rooms at the Library of Congress. And now to introduce our speaker is Abby Yokelson. Okay, so as a reference librarian in the main reading room, I do have the most fascinating job in the world because I just never know who will come up to the reference desk and ask me a question that will just be the, an interesting um, thing for the rest of the evening or for years later. So um, it was, Jenny and I remembered it was just about three years ago in April, Monday night, we both remembered that, and she wandered up to the reference desk and said, I'm trying to find this little pamphlet, it's been hard to find, and the title is, this is a good one, Some Reasons for Chinese Exclusion, Meat versus Rice, American Manhood Against Asiatic Coolism, Which Shall Survive? <laughs> well, we know what their feelings were. Well, this was published by the American Federation of Labor, and it was republished as Senate Document Number 137 in the 57th Congress in 1902, and it's on display back there. And, um, and then um, our speaker said, and while you're at it, do you have anything about Chinatown in, in Washington? I'd like to see any materials on that. Well, you know, here at the Library of Congress, you wait a while for materials to be brought to you. So we had a wonderful evening's chat in between the materials coming about soy sauce and takeout count, um, cartons and fortune cookies and what's the most popular day in the entire year for Chinese people to get married and and um, and our speaker said you know I'm thinking maybe I'm going to write a book on this subject and I said wow if you ever write that book will you please please let me know and we'll arrange a book program here at the Library of Congress I promise we'll make it happen and a mere three years later here is Jennifer Eight Lee with the Fortune Cookie Chronicles, Adventures in the World of Chinese Food. So um, Jenny's parents were immigrants from China. She grew up in New York City and um, I think fluent in Mandarin Chinese, is that right? Um, but always really perplexed about the differences between what she ate at home, what her mother cooked, and what she ate in the Chinese restaurants where she really loved beef with broccoli, which is not, <laughs> not Chinese according to her mother. 
Then there was that trauma in junior high school when she read in Amy Tan's book, The Joy Luck Club, that there were no fortune cookies in China, that they didn't know what fortune cookies were. So as she said, it started a lifelong obsession with Chinese food and Chinese food in America and the whole sort of cultural and sociological and historical picture that all of this, that all grows out of. Um, Jen, Jenny uh, graduated from Harvard in 1999 with a degree in applied mathematics and economics. But I think secretly she knew she always wanted to be a reader. I mean, a writer. A reader and a writer, right. <laughs> right, both of them. You can't be one without the other. So um, then she went off to the University of Beijing to study international relations, but really it was uh, a study in everything about China and everything Chinese and traveled all over during the time she was there and then hired at the mere age of 24 at the New York Times as a reporter, Metro reporter, where she has gained quite a reputation for her um, cultural stories, her in-depth stories. She's both explored um, a Chinese uh, recently immigrated family that moved from New York City to Georgia, a tiny little town of 700 people, to open a Chinese restaurant. They had no experience whatsoever, and Jenny sort of tracked their progress and what, and what happened there. And also, the big story, the big breaking story, was that Powerball um, winning, the lottery winning in 2005 when way, way too many people won the lottery, and uh, they suspected fraud, and it turned out the winning um, thing was numbers off of fortune cookies. <laughs> that they, they all had gotten their numbers from fortune cookies. So that set Jenny on a quest to track down all the restaurants where they had bought the fortune cookies, who worked in those restaurants, what their menus were like. Um, it got expanded by her publisher who sent her on a quest to find the greatest Chinese restaurant outside of Greater China. So six continents and 23 countries and 40 states later, Jenny has the answer, but I guess you have to read the book to find it out. Anyhow, Jenny's research skills astound me because she not only is a fabulous investigative reporter and that she knows who to call, the right person to call, who leads her to the next right person, and her interviewing skills are amazing. But she's also a lot younger than most of us in this audience, and so her online skills are <laughs> unbelievable. And she combines all of that with traditional research skills. She really knows how to use a library. And what you see in her bibliography in this book is um, demonstrated back there on the table. We have pulled a lot of items from her bibliography, and plus a few other things that I found kind of fascinating. Um, the Chinese cooking section here cookery Chinese, for those of you who are catalogers, <laughs> is just amazing. And I particularly like looking at the really famous Chinese chefs like Craig Claiborne. <laughs> and um, here's, here's Naturally Chinese by Ruth Rodale Spira, and our own very favorite Chinese cook, Betty Crocker. <laughs> and then you can't absolutely have anything in America without Chinese cooking for dummies. <laughs> But this, this one's written by Martin Yan, who actually is Chinese and has a great cooking show. So um, I encourage you to take a look at the display after we hear from Jenny. And um, there's one back there I really like. The recipes are in Chinese and English. Not very attractive pictures, but it tells you all the healthful properties of the dishes you're cooking. So there's a clam recipe that I'm dying to try that promises to nourish my kidneys improve my eyesight and make me beautiful. All that from one dish. So, and there's another book back there called Chinese Food for Thought. It has a proverb section in the back and it tells us that food is heaven. So uh, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Eight Lee. And I'm deliberately not telling you what the eight means so somebody can ask that question as soon as we're done. Thank you. Apparently, the Library of Congress is hostile to Macs. I have a Mac. Let's see if it works. Okay. So, uh, my name is Jennifer Lee. I am obsessed with Chinese food, and I, I'm, I'm very flattered that you guys are willing to share my obsession. But one thing, I have a blog, and, I'm, and I like to keep records of, like, <laughs> of my speaking. So, <laughs> be forewarned. Um, the blog is actually at fortunecookiechronicles.com, if you guys want to see it. It's, there's, it's like mostly my reviews, some of my you know, observations about what it's like to go on tour, one of which is if you are a woman and you go on TV, you should always wear a camisole because they always mic you basically through your shirt, in case you guys are ever wondering. So um, 
<laughs> I'm just gonna go, and you guys, can, there's, I'm sure there are way more questions than I am able to answer um, in the time allotted, but I, I have about a 20 minute presentation. It is actually amusing, and it was kind of cool, because I, I, I did it at the New York Times last week, and I could say, oh, I'm just practicing, because you know, I'm speaking at the Library of Congress next week. <laughs> and it's true, so now I'm here, I'm very excited. And uh, so here we go. So there are actually more Chinese restaurants in this country than McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Wendy's combined. Yeah, mm-hmm, 40,000, 40,000. Actually, Chinese food is the most pervasive food on the planet, served on all seven continents, even Antarctica. <laughs> it is, it's true, because <laughs> Monday night is Chinese food night at McMurdo Station, which is the main scientific station in Antarctica. <laughs> Chinese restaurants have played a large role in history. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis was actually resolved, I don't know if you know, at the Yenching Palace, which is a restaurant in Washington, D.C., recently closed. And the boarding house where John Wilkes Booth and accomplices planned the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is actually now a Chinese restaurant called, I always get this, this one always sticks for some reason. Hi, why is it not moving? It's actually a Chinese restaurant called Walk and Roll, which is on H Street. And this is actually the, the plaque that reminds you. Now, I actually just thought walk and roll was being cute, but someone pointed out to me that it's Chinese food and sushi, so hence the walk and the roll. So, um, so the Americanness of Chinese food actually became very apparent to me. Uh, March 30th, 2005, Powerball, based on the number of um, tickets they had sold, they had statistically expected three or four second place winners. Because the way the lotteries work, it's a little bit like insurance, right? You, you sell a lot of things for a little bit and sometimes you have a big payout. But statistically, you want to make sure that everything comes out so you have a little bit of a profit. So instead of three or four winners, actually, they had an unexpectedly high 110 and they were totally blown away by that. And they thought at first it was fraud, but, uh, or maybe a computer glitch, but it came from all across the country. I think it's like tw it was like 23 of the 25 Powerball states. So as they did, um, investigation, the first question is, okay, was it a pattern? Because sometimes people do like little hearts or diamonds or whatever on, on their Powerball little grids, and it wasn't that. So their next thought was like, okay, let's go to TV. So um, Lost, there was actually a, a power, there was like a lottery number. I don't watch the show, but there's like some very large man who had some bad luck with a, power, with a lottery number, and they matched that, and it wasn't that. And then, there was, then they were like, okay, what about the young and the restless? Because there actually was also some plot line involving um, Powerball. And it wasn't that. And as the winners came in, this is actually the, the Tennessee winning place, whatever, the lottery center, um, they asked, you know, where did you get your number from? Because they always do this in order to do like PR press releases. And the first person was like, well, I actually got it from a fortune cookie. And this actually is the fortune. They had the, the Tennessee people sent it to me, yeah. And the second person, <laughs> and, they, they, and the funny thing is, it was the first, it was second place, right? So the first five numbers, match and the fourth one didn't. So the interesting, sorry, the first five numbers match and the sixth one didn't. And the reason why that's important is actually if they matched all six, that would have been better from Powerball because then all 110 people would have just shared the top number. But because it's second place, it's a fixed number. So it was $19 million in unexpected costs out of, they only had a reserve fund of 25 million actually. So this it was, it was particularly stunning and a little bit weird. So I was like, well, this is really interesting. You know, so it's all across the country. So I decided, I decided to go all across the country to figure out like who are these people and why are they playing these numbers and why, like what, what is it about Chinese food that makes it such a universal experience? So I actually tracked down a whole bunch of the winners. This woman actually in Wyoming is the founder of the Elvis Presley International Fan Club. That's her at 16 and her now. She actually does have handwritten letters from Elvis and she used to talk to him like once a month when he was serving in uh, Germany. I think he like served in Germany during the war or something, yeah. And apparently he's a very bad speller for those of you who are grammarian. <laughs> and I actually went and tracked down all of the restaurants and there are many of them. Um, many of them actually are named China Buffet, you know, as you guys will see. And it was, it was I'm, I'm, I'm very, yeah, there are three China, Bu China Buffets. <laughs> and they were all over the country. I mean, they were in places like Powell, Wyoming, Dover, New Hampshire, Manitoba, Wisconsin, Bernalillo, New Mexico, Wichita, Omaha. Scottsdale, Arizona, and Caledonia, po population 2,965, which does not stop it from being the wild turkey capital of Minnesota, actually. <laughs> um, and 
You know, pulling back after a very weird obsessive quest <laughs> and looking at all the restaurants and all the winners and all the towns, it kind of struck me. I mean, their stories were all similar, but they were all different. Like it was lunch, it was dinner, it was takeout, it was sit down, it was a buffet, it was, you know, with my, my, my family, it was my friends, it was my coworkers, it was last week, it was three months ago. Either way, the stories at some point involved a fortune cookie and at some point involved a Chinese restaurant. And what's also really interesting to me was these are just the people that won on one day, right? Which means if you think about how many people were playing and didn't win, it's a little bit mind-boggling. So my little epiphany after all this was, well, of our benchmark for American is this apple pie. How often do you eat Chinese food? And how often do you eat apple pie? <laughs> so, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's true. Um, so, but the key thing to remember, actually, is like now it's very much an institutional part of our of our culture. But that wasn't always the case. When the Chinese first came to America, uh, you know, the, the Americans thought they ate dogs, if not dogs, then cats, if not cats, then then rats. Actually, my esteemed employer in 1883 ran an article that asked, "Do the Chinese eat rats?" Uh, and they actually sent out a reporter to ask and figure out if they ate rats. And the the evidence at the end was there was no evidence of rats or cats to be seen. Um, and it's funny, the Chinese men like threatened slander. They, they really got into the, um, the legal system very early on. You'll see example of this later on. So did the Chinese eat rats? I mean, that seems a little bit kind of weird to us now, but you know, given the popular imagery of the time, it wasn't totally out of the question. This is an ad uh, for a rat poison called Rough on Rats. Still to this day, no one can figure out what date it's from, but if you see very, very subtly, it says they must go, which is a, is, a, is a reference both to the Chinese and to the rats, because at that time there was not a lot of pro-Chinese sentiment, and we'll get to that later. So the interesting thing about food is it's a way to differentiate us versus them, because in a way, if you're eating something different from us, you are actually, you know, you are different from us. And, a, and we see it sort of, that kind of echoed throughout many different things during the late 1800s. For example, at a... Um, murder trial where a Chinese man was on, uh, was sort of being tried for homicide, the, the lawyer said, your honor, what do you expect? They eat rice with sticks. And this was the defense lawyer. He was defending <laughs> the lawyer. Or um, as Abby mentioned before, there was a document called um, Some Reasons for Chinese Exclusion, Meat versus Rice, American Manhood versus Asiatic Coolism, which still survive. And basically the premise of this, if you ever to read it, is the, the idea that, well, Asian men, or Chinese men specifically, ate rice, and they would drag down the standard of living for American men who ate, you know, real men who ate meat. And in a way, that was one of the reasons we had to keep them out. Because um, to sort of understand the dynamics that led to such a, you know, enlightened <laughs> document, we should go back again to why the Chinese first came to America. So uh, prior to 1950, like prior to World War II, essentially 90% of the Chinese immigrants to America came from an area called Toisan or Taishan, depending on how you pronounce it. It's about four hours from um, Hong Kong by bus and really just not a trip you'd want to take for fun. Um, I went there and basically during the, the late, the mid sort of 1800s, there, they had a sort of cataclysmic series of really bad things happened that led to war and famine and um, there was also starvation, all kinds of bad things. So a lot of the Chinese men at that time left and they came to America and they also went to Australia. And they worked because that's what they uh, wanted to do. And it's important to remember that when the Chinese first came to America, they were not opening restaurants because Americans didn't want to eat their food because they thought they were eating weird animals with four legs or not. So, in fact, um, in, if you go back and look at sort of historical documents at that time, you see, like, what, what were the Chinese doing as jobs? You know, the top 50 jobs from, like, whatever, 18-something, 1870 or so. Um, Chinese restaurant worker was not listed anywhere in that. Prostitute, however, was actually one of the top 50 jobs and of, among the Chinese. So what were they doing? When they first came, they actually worked in mining, they worked in railroads, they worked in agriculture, and they worked in factories. Um, this uh, generally didn't go over w well with the American male, who felt very threatened because, you know, these people worked hard and they worked for cheap, which is still um, not going over so well now, except that we call it outsourcing when we send it over to China. But imagine if all the people instead were here, the violence is, does not go over so well. So there was, a, there, there was sort of these huge waves of anti-Chinese violence up and down the West Coast. You, know, t you can Google, like, Tacoma, Chinese violence, anti-right, right, and Los Angeles, and Seattle, and um, San Francisco. Why, places like um, in Idaho and Wyoming also had a lot of sort of virulent anti-Chinese sentiment. 
So as they were sort of beating up and killing the Chinese people, what they were doing to the employers was boycotting them. And this basically had two effects of sort of leading to the spread of Chinese restaurants, one of which is it drove the Chinese men away from the West Coast, so into the interior, into, in, onto the East Coast. And that's when you see a lot of the, the rise in uh, Chinatowns in Boston, San Francisco, uh, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. And uh, the other thing it, it had an effect on was it sort of sort of narrowed the industries that the Chinese worked in because they had to be self-employed. And the two, two dominant industries that emerged, one was uh, laundries, as we guys all know, uh, which Abercrombie and Fitch actually recently, a couple of years ago, had a T-shirt that said, two Wongs make it white. And, um, <laughs> and like, the thing is, I actually kind of thought that was funny, but I'm, I know it's like on premise. I'm supposed to think it's racist, but, the, but it kind of sort of harkens to a time when we thought of Chinese people working always in la laundries. The other main industry, of course, was restaurants. And so the interesting question is, well, why were these two ch fields chosen, given the, like, everything else that they did in terms of agriculture, um, manufacturing? Actually, one of the number one f uh, fields that Chinese worked in originally was cigar manufacturing in the early sort of like when they first came over. It was very interesting, because like, who makes cigars today? But it, it was like number one, two, or three, I remember. But these two fields were actually really interesting and chosen. One, because it was, one was cleaning, and the other one was cooking. And these were women's work, so they're not threatening to the American male. So now they opened all these restaurants, and they had to find something that the Americans would eat, because they don't want to eat rats or cats or dogs. So in 1896, very, very shortly after, you see the invention of a dish called chop suey. And chop suey is basically familiar things like pork or chicken or beef or whatever, and mixed with vegetables. Um, bean sprouts were really popular. Water chestnuts are really popular. Uh, interestingly enough, actually at that time, broccoli was not popular, because at that time, Americans didn't eat broccoli. Broccoli only became popular in the 1920s from, um, from Italy, and mostly because of an Italian fam family that did excellent marketing. So in case everyone, anyone ever wonders, broccoli, not a Chinese vegetable. Guarantee you, General Tao never saw a stock of broccoli in his life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it, within a certain amount of time, chop suey became incredibly popular, incredibly chic. It was the way that you can impress a, a date. It was, um, if you wanted to have a cool lunch party, you could make chop suey using like nut oil, which is sesame oil, or you know Chinese sauces or Mandarin sauces. Um, this is a famous painting. It's actually, I think, exhibiting in Chicago right now. So in my, my world, chop suey, I think, is the biggest culinary joke one uh, culture played on another, because as you guys probably know, there isn't really something called chop suey in China, even though Americans were under the impression it was, quote, their national dish. Uh, so chop suey in Chinese actually translates to za sui, uh, or chop suey if it's Cantonese, which in English translates back to odds and ends, so leftovers, basically. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the historic sort of legend of how chop suey was created is very much tied to this guy who, his name is Li Hongzhang, um, spelled all different kind of ways back then because the transliteration wasn't standardized. But he um, was a famous Chinese diplomat that came over to America in 1896. Big, big visit. We covered it seriously. Like the New York Times and all the mainstream media covered it with the same sort of fervency that the tabloids covered Brangelina. Like when his luggage left London, we wrote a little story that said 300 pieces of his luggage have left London to, you know, on the way to New York. So the standard story, and it's, it's so standard, it's actually in history books, is that either he or someone else um, either created for or created by him chop suey because someone didn't like what was being served that day. And when they asked the chef, like, oh, you know, what is it that you made? They're, he's like, oh, it's, you know, leftovers or chop suey. And that's how the, the rumor started. Um, actually, so the, the banquet that's most closely associated with this is um, a banquet at the Wa Waldorf Astoria in the late, um, I think it was August, it was like August 30th or something. So I actually went and found the New York Times article about that. And we were obsessive then, as we are now. And basically, what you find is that the menu is actually entirely in French. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a French menu. It was like consomme or something. And he didn't like French food, so he, it actually even says what he ate. He ate uh, a bowl of rice, some steamed chicken, and broth. And so there's like no, no mention of chop suey to be found, actually, in, in the New York Times version of the story. So you're like, okay, well, then where did the story come from? Or where did this dish come from? So again, we go back to my favorite publication, the New York Times, because they pay my salary. And in 1904... There is, this, there is a very odd article. So this is a wonderful thing about like writing this article now, and um, which is you can have um, you can now a lot of old art, newspaper articles have been 
PDF and OCR. So I can do a search on chop suey, and then you can find all these mentions of chop suey that have like never probably have not been seen since like the early 1900s. This one actually is about a guy named Lim Seng. He comes over and he's like, I want all of the New Yorkers to stop making chop suey because they're violating my intellectual property. Because he actually claims he is the original inventor and sole proprietor of the dish known as chop suey. You can take it or leave it. I don't know if you know you want to believe him, but uh, the the story that he set, tells is that. Um, it was right. It was sort of time to the arrival of Lee Hongzhang, and he was working for basically an American restaurant owner, who said, "You know, you should make a dish that could pass as Chinese, and uh, and sort of sort of you know satisfy the sort of public craze about China at the time." So he did, and um, this is us quoting him in so oh so elegant English. But basically, the point was his his accusation at that time was the man then stole his recipe. And then he has spent many years uh, looking for the man uh, who has made all this money off of his recipe. And meanwhile, he wants everyone else who's making chop suey to stop because that was his intellectual property. I actually tried looking for the court case in New York City, and there was no <laughs> there was no evidence of it to be found. So you can kind of take it or leave it. I actually tend to more believe him than not, just because a lot of the pieces fit. Um, specifically, that there's like no mention or very very few mentions of chop suey, and always in sort of a different context before 1896. As of 1897, the number of like sort of chop suey hits you get in Procast, one of my favorite um, programs, kind of skyrocket. So whatever it was, it was something that was very sudden, and it, it sort of just you know took off. So let's go back to what exactly Lem Seng you know did or did not create. And this is sort of this interesting dish, chop suey, which has an interesting kind of take. It takes Things which are familiar, which are vegetables, and things that are just slightly exotic, and it combines them, which is sort of the recipe and and uh, formula that Chinese restaurateurs have used both then and to this day. So another example where we see this um, is my dish, the one that I obsess about, uh, General Tao's chicken. Actually, the original name of my book was The Long March of General Tao. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that was negged. But um, General Tao's chicken. This is many, many versions of General Tao's chicken. It is sort of the ultimate Chinese-American dish. It is chicken. It is fried. It is sweet. All things Americans love. And my favorite thing is in, it actually in the Naval Academy, it's called Ad Admiral Tao's chicken. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, so I was like, OK, wh who is General Tao, and why are we eating his chicken? And I think we're going to move this next slide, which does, ah, OK. So. Uh, so I go to China, to General Tao's hometown. Um, and so the interesting thing about General Tao is he's actually a very, very famous Qing Dynasty military hero. He played a large role in the, in the Taiping Rebellion, which was started by a guy who thought he was the younger son of um, God and also the baby brother of Jesus Christ. Caused, caused a re uh, civil war, killed 20 million people, still the deadliest civil war to this day. This was hard. Like, it took us three hours to make a trip that really took only one hour that should have taken. So this guy hitched a ride with us and was like, yeah, go to the end of the road, make a left. Um, so long. So we finally found a restaurant owner who uh, gave us a map. It's like, you know, this is General Howe's hometown. And yeah, we found it. This, this billboard says, welcome to the, home, the, the hometown of General Tao. This is the general himself. Um, and so we started, I started looking for chicken. Actually found, <laughs> found a cow. Chinese people lo love cows. Uh, there were the chicken. They were actually crossing the road, which I thought was funny. <laughs> and these, these are General Tao's dis, like, relatives, like five or six generations. Five, these are five generations off. This guy's seven generations off, I think. Um, and they're like, we don't know this dish. We've never seen it. We don't know what you are talking about. Um, but they did offer me dog meat, which I thought was interesting. They do eat dog, yep, yep. And um, I was thinking, I was like, God, General Tao's puppy, not going to go over well here. So. I was like, OK, so clearly this dish does not come from Hunan. Um, and it struck me, you know, in America, General Tao is sort of like Colonel Sanders, because he's known for chicken and not war. But in China, he's actually known for war, not chicken. Like, they were not surprised I was there, like, paying homage to this man, because they're like, yeah, he's a great military hero. And of course, you should come and visit. Um, so I was like, well, where did it come from? You know, more research, more research. Luckily, I'm doing this right now because any more research, uh, sorry, like 10 years, a lot of these people would be dead. So it turns out that uh, General Tao as a recipe was introduced in New York City in the early 1970s as part of a huge wave of revolution in Chinese food in America where Hunan and Sichuan cuisine basically kind of pushed out the old chop suey, chow mein, egg foo young. Um, and 
I the the guy who invented it, uh, the original General Tao's chicken, which is slightly different from the recipe. They kind of merged later. Um, actually, was alive in Taiwan, specifically Taipei. Here he is. He's retired. Plays a lot of mahjong all day. <laughs> the restaurant actually now is run by his son. And this was the original General Tao's chicken. And I I literally flew into Taipei for the afternoon, ate the chicken, interviewed him, flew back to Hong Kong. Yeah. I was, I'm absolutely obsessed. So the General Tso's chicken, as, as he made it, though, tastes nothing like our version. First of all, it's not sweet, it's not fried, it has bone, it has, chicken, it has uh, skin. And um, I actually showed him <laughs> all of the pictures of General of General Tso's chicken I'd taken, and he was completely horrified. He's like, what is that? You know, The baby corn did not go over well, the broccoli did not. He's like, what is that? And, I, and we're like, broccoli, you know, it's really popular in America. He's like, never seen it. Uh, and actually, maybe he's seen it, but he didn't. He just was completely disturbed because if you notice, General Tao in this case doesn't. It just it just is. There's no vegetable thing happening, right? It's it just is in its own splendor of chickenness. Um, so as he left, he actually said, "Moming chi mao," which means this is all nonsense, and he just kind of got up and left. But one of the more familiar things of it of General Tao's chicken was this is how it was spelled on the the menu, which, which kind of felt, that kind of harkened back to an American Chinese restaurant. So chop suey is actually um, connected to the, chi the region of China named Toisan. General Tao's chicken is actually connected to a region of China called Fuzhou. Uh, Fuzhou is, there's a Delaware-sized region outside, um, sort of around the city of Fuzhou, which is where the vast majority of Chinese restaurant workers actually now come from. And 300,000 people are missing from that area, which I think if you add it together makes it like, if you added all those people together, most of them are America, makes it the 50th or 60th largest city in America. Um, they basically at this rate pay tens of thousands. The going rate now is $74,000 to be smuggled from Fuzhou to America to work. So it's sort of like mortgaging your own life. And uh, it's interesting because historically Fuzhou, very poor swampy fishermen type things. But in the last 15 to 20 years, the money that these workers have made in terms of Chinese restaurants has been sent back. So these are single family homes. These are not apartment buildings. I mean, ch of course, Chinese people have very large families, but, but they're considered mansions, which, uh, though they're ugly. I mean, the, the Chinese really love tile, so everything has the appearance of like an inside out bathroom in my world. And there's a lot of construction, a lot of construction. I mean, these, these houses by, in terms of American dollars, assuming that our, I mean, this is when I did the research, who knows with the, the collapse of a dollar now, it was about $250,000. And it's really interesting, because they, um, they just like put Western things, you know, it's like Greek columns and French doors or whatnot. And it's, it's funny, because to them, that just looks modern. And from our eyes, it looks tacky, right? But, but to be fair, we kind of do the same thing. So one of the things that I do in my book is I go visit P.F. Chang's. Okay, right? No, no, P.F. Chang's, okay, P.F. is Paul Fleming, he's a white guy, who just wanted a nice sort of upscale version of a Chinese restaurant. So you go, and I, I actually took one of the Powerball restaurant owners who had worked briefly um, at a P.F. Chang's, which is funny, because most, most likely if you're eating at a P.F. Chang's, a guy who's cooking your food is Mexican. Um, so when he, he showed up for training, everyone's like, oh my God, a real Chinese person, you know? And, and he, he took me to P.F. Chang's, and I don't know if you guys have ever been to P.F. Chang's, but you know, they have the whole terracotta warrior thing going with the horses and the men. And it's kind of nice, like from an American perspective, you're like, oh, it's Asian without being like a panda or a dragon. And he was there and he's like, dude, this thing symbolizes death, right? Because the terracotta warriors were buried with Qing Su Huangdi, who's the first emperor. So like when, when Chinese people look at P.F. Chang's, you're like, dude, this entire place is decorated with death. But from an Asian perspective, from an American perspective, we're like, it's Asian, you know, it, and without being pandas or dragons. So it, it just goes both ways, just to remind you. Anyway, so in this town, I also found chicken. <laughs> Hoi. But I did not find his people. There are not people in this town because, they, like in this town called Hoi, 80% of the people are missing. Uh, there are old men and old women, children, and women, but no no men of working age, which is kind of weird. So it's it's like a nation at war, except they're not at war. They're <laughs> delivering your chicken to your door. Um, and so the, the economy of that area is actually really tied into restaurants to the point where. This is where the audio would have worked, but it's okay. They have English language schools that teach restaurant English uh, to teenagers who are preparing to illegally immigrate. So, I don't know, it, you, you, it's, the, sound, the audio is just like coming from my laptop, but it's like So, you know, French fries. The guy was very specific 
in saying, do not say French flies. That doesn't go very well. Very key, very key, actually. And um, so this guy is not paying attention, probably going to be a delivery man. <laughs> So what's, what's also really important is that a lot of these Chinese restaurant workers, they work so hard, they cannot take care of their own children. They do, just simply do not have the time. So what you have is a phenomenon of babies being born here, so they have American citizenship, then being shipped back to China, $500 to send a kid back. To, to someone will, four, four or $500, they will bring the baby back, $1,000 to bring the baby uh, back here when they're six. So you basically have... Um, Okay, so at least half of these kids born in America raised by parents. Mm -hmm. And so I, I interviewed them. Where are you from? In America. Where is your mom and dad? In America. What are they doing in America? In the government. Where are they doing in America? They are in America. They are in America. So on that happy note, let's go back to our, our favorite topic, fortune cookies. So Americans love fortune cookies, love, love fortune cookies. We have chocolate fortune cookies, orange fortune cookies, raspberry fortune cookies, mint, mint fortune cookies, wedding fortune cookies, Christmas fortune cookies, Valentine's Day fortune cookies, Hanada Hanukkah fortune cookies. <laughs> we do. Fortune cookie jewelry, fortune cookie USB, fortune cookies for dogs. And for those who of you who want to preserve your fortune cookie memories, there are fortune cookie albums. Fortunealbum.com, actually. Um, it's like a photo album, except that you can tuck <laughs> your fortune in there. Invented by a Jew, by the way. Um, so where are there not fortune cookies? Well, China. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting, because they, they, they would look at it, and they could read the Chinese on it, because fortune cookies in America actually have Chinese on them. So, but it's nonsensical to them, right? And, and they're asked, well, what is it? And I'm like, oh. It's, from America, and they eat it, and they discover this piece of paper. And, and generally, their sentiment was, Americans are so strange. Like, why are they doing <laughs> Right? So, so to, to give you, I mean, I grew up, you know, the early part of my life thinking fortune cookies were Chinese, right? Because I had been to a bunch of, I had grown up in New York City, and um, we always got the fortune cookies when we went to Chinese restaurants, and I had not been to China at that point, so what did I know? And it was really when I was reading <laughs> the Joy Luck Club when I discovered, for, it was like the first time I ever learned fortune cookies weren't Chinese, because in, in it there's a conversation, two Chinese mothers, Chinese mothers, great fictional characters, like always, if I ever were to write a novel, I would base it on a Chinese mother. Um, and they were discussing fortune cookies and how like they'd never seen them before. And to me, remember I'm 13, it was like learning there was like no Santa Claus and I was adopted at the same time because it's sort of like this like weird, weird like discombobulation of your, your sense of identity, right? Like fortune cookies were Chinese, therefore I was Chinese too. But if fortune cookies are not Chinese, am I Chinese? That was sort of the idea. So I went hunting for fortune cookies. Like where did they come from? Clearly they didn't come from China. So I went to, these are some of the largest fortune cookie manufacturers or oldest fortune cookie manufacturers in the United States. You know, I interviewed this guy who actually half of all fortune cookie fortunes, not the cookies, just the fortunes, go through his hands. Because fortune cookie manufacturers learned a long time ago they were in the food manufacturing business, not the professional soothsaying business, so they outsourced it to him. Yeah, same Stephen Yang doesn't speak English. It's a little weird, actually. Uh, women who make fortune cookies, old Japanese women, old Chinese men. This guy is like 94 and uh, came over to, Ch to America when he was like four, made fortune cookies in like the early like 1920s, I want to say, maybe. Um, I even found a guy who kind of looked like Confucius. And <laughs> lots of manufacturing. So I go to Hong Kong um, a Noodle Factory, which is in LA. And this is probably the oldest fortune cookies still existence on the planet to this day. It is an unopened can of fortune cookies, and we think it's from at the very latest, the 1950s, because that's when they stopped making cans of fortune cookies. So the key thing to note here is they're called tea cakes, and that's actually the original name prior to World War II. Tea they're called tea cakes. And um, why is this significant? Well, Chinese people don't eat tea with cakes, but you know what? Japanese people do. So this actually then brought me to a series of Japanese bakeries. This one is in LA. This one is uh, in San Francisco. They still make like sort of Japanese sweets to this day. And it also doubles as a diner, which is kind of funny. They serve actually Polish sausage. 
So this guy, this guy named Ricky, I mean, they, they're, they, they sound like they're Irish. I mean, they're like, you know, Ricky, John. I mean, it's, it's totally weird because if you close your eyes, you know, they're, they're like American. I mean, they are American, but it just, it's very stunning. So Ricky led me to his cousin Teresa, who led me to his cousin Gary, her cousin Gary, who's the only person I've met as, as obsessed with fortune cookies as I am. Yeah. And so he, so the, the old story is that fortune cookies were introduced in the Japanese tea garden at the Golden Gate Park. And um, his grandfather, is that right, his grandfather? His grandfather, a great fan, or we were, they, it all gets kind of mixed up, um, was, owned the Ben Kyoto shop, the one that we saw, that they made the fortune cookies for the Japanese tea garden. And what he had there actually is these tongs that are used to make the fortune cookies, the very original ones. So you basically grill this little kind of wafer and then you fold it. More interesting than that was he had a copy of this drawing from 1883 or thereabouts, maybe. It is, shows a man actually making fortune cookies and they, they're called tsuji ura senbei, which tsuji ura is like a sort of an obscure word for a type of fortune and senbei means cracker or cake or biscuit. It means it's sort of a catch-all phrase meaning food thing that could be you know flat and somewhat sweet and somewhat maybe savory. Um, so I was like, whoa, this is really interesting because the drawing exists decades before any mention of fortune cookies in America. So that led me to Japan. And I again, remember, I'm very obsessed. There's, luckily, I had a good advance to sort of travel around the world with this. So I found a bunch of um, family-owned bakeries outside Kyoto, where they were still making fortune cookies by hand. Yeah. And um, here are the fortune cookies with other sort of fortune cookie-related type things. So you see the family resemblance there, because I hate to tell uh, people, but. If anyone knows anything about Chinese desserts, fortune cookies resemble nothing in the Chinese sort of lexicon of sweet things. So first of all, Chinese desserts in general suck. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm comfortable admitting that. This is something that we long discovered as children in America. Um, and this is actually why bake sales were so hard when you're like seven, because you know, we Chinese people don't bake <laughs> because uh, one of the reasons is um, it's not energy efficient. Right, wok cooking, very energy efficient. Chinese cooking very much sort of exists with this idea of being efficient. That's why they use the entire animal. Um, but you know, you're know, you seven and you're told to make things for bake sales and that just was very befuddling to us. And in fact, in China today, a lot of my friends who are American go over to be expats and they show up in these like fancy, fancy apartment buildings and they're like, there's no oven. Because there are no ovens in, in fancy, fancy apartment buildings in China, you know, and not so fancy, fancy apartments in China because Chinese people don't bake. So their first thought is, oh my God, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? Because they have no idea how to have like Thanksgiving without baking a turkey. So I'm like, it's all about the Peking duck, don't worry. So that's actually what most people do. They, they have Peking duck um, for Thanksgiving. Anyway, so this guy also has these grills, which I thought kind of resembled the ones that Gary had. These are actually the original ones, he said. He found them rusting in like a family garage somewhere. And they also kind of resemble the things that that guy is using there. And so when you put them together, this is the American fortune cookie and then the Japanese fortune cookie, I think you could argue that the, that the family resemblance is undeniable. And as, as I like to say sometimes, like if you, think, if you think of me as the little yellow one, I have a friend who's a CNN reporter, the daughter of Nigerian immigrants, we say she's sort of the larger one. And um, so the interesting question is, well, how did fortune cookies go from being something that was Chinese, sorry, from Japanese to being something that was Chinese? And oops, um, the short answer in the thesis that I present in the book, and you can take it or leave it, I'm not saying this is academically rigorous, um, this is the nice thing about being a journalist. You don't actually have to defend everything to <laughs> academic rigor. Uh, is that, you know, Japanese people were making fortune cookies and then we shut all of them up during World War II, including those that made fortune cookies. And that at the same time was when Chinese food actually experienced a surge in popularity for a couple of reasons. One, which was uh, China was suddenly our ally. So not much, not the same sort of threat as they were when it was like meat versus rice era. Two, um, during wartime rationing, Chinese food makes a little bit of meat go a long way. So there was also a surge in popularity during that period. So you actually see a tripling of demand in Chinese food from 1942 to 1945 in San Francisco. So um, <clears throat> basically, yeah, that's what happened, I think. And so Chinese people stepped in um, in a kind of late 40s. Like you see a lot of the Chinese um, 
bakeries and made fortune cookies being opened up in 46, 47, 48. And what happened actually in terms of how the popularity spread is during World War II, lots of American soldiers in and out of San Francisco, number one port of anything for you know Europe or Asia during World War II. They go to Chinese restaurants, love the, you know, love the food, go home after the war, and they ask their local Chinese restaurants in Iowa and Minnesota, why don't you have those Chinese cookies? Like the, the authentic ones. And so these people are like, what cookies? But remember, all of these people came from one region, Toysan, right? So the same way that they do in Fuzhou right now, which is everyone's either a neighbor or related or you know, some, someone to everyone else because it's they're from a very, very small region. So somehow through word of mouth very quickly, they decide uh, the, the popularity of fortune cookies spreads to the point that in the late 1950s, 250 million fortune cookies are being made per year. Um, and they're being used in the presidential elections in 1960. Uh, both Seward Symington and, um, who was it? Symington and, oh, I forget his name, but I'll, Adlai Stevenson, that's it. So my next question was, okay, well, where did the fortunes come from? Because I thought that was an interesting question. So these are fortunes um, from Wonton Food, same company that has the fortune cookies in the back that you have now. So I actually went back to the source, which was Confucius. And I was like, well, what, what did Confucius really say? He actually said a lot, very little which fits on a fortune cookie. <laughs> you know, I did, I went through, read the Analects, and I found like maybe 40 fortunes, which is nothing, because Wonton Food has a database of about 10,000. Um, and part of the reason why what Chinese sages say does not port over well to what Americans say is because the world view is a little bit different. So a great example is um, America, we have a saying, squeaky wheel gets to Greece. Chinese have a slightly alternative saying, same situation, which is chang dao chu tou niao, which means the bird whose head sticks out gets shot. <laughs> <laughs> And remember, right? <laughs> Fundamental, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other thing is, uh, China for a long time was a very rural agrarian society. Still is, 80% rural. No matter what you, you know, whatever pictures you see of Shanghai or whatever, most of the people that you, that are in China are like General Tao's relatives, the ones that I showed you. About 80% still. So the thing is, you know, a lot of your wisdom is then sort of informed by, like, agriculture. And America, like, maybe 2% of people live on a farm or work, it's something like 2% are even rural. And most of the people who work on farms, uh, admittedly these days are probably like from across the border. So we don't necessarily have a very good premise of understanding agriculture. So you have things in Chinese like, you know, when in a melon patch, do not bend down and tie your shoes. Oops, did I lose that? Which does not make sense at all to me when my mom shared it with me. And I was like, what is this, this is about prison? I don't really get this. Um, and, um, <laughs> Basically, it means don't do anything that looks suspicious, even when it's not. So that just serves to remind us that our cultural folk wisdoms are passed down, you know, through just society. Or as my and certain things that make sense to one society does not make sense to another. So, for example, my mom always wondered, don't you need your cake in order to eat it? And so that still doesn't make sense to her. It doesn't really completely make sense for me, but you know, I understand what it is because. I've, it's, been, it's been in my cultural surroundings since I was young. So I went and found all these fortune cookie writers. Here's one. He was an unemployed novelist when I found him, sort of writing fortune cookies, fortunes as a side gig. Didn't make him that much money. I think he earned like $700 for like, like weeks and weeks worth of uh, writing. So I interviewed him and other people, and I was like, God, okay, where do you get your ideas from? They were like, okay, well, Bartlett's quotations. This is really good. <laughs> Bible. The horoscope. This is where the you have a kind and generous nature thing comes from. <laughs> then uh, one girl was like Hallmark. Same girl was like email forwards. This is the daughter of Stephen Yang, the guy who controls all of the fortunes. Um, television. She was like, oh, the OC. That was good. OC. Um, and movies. And movies. And I was like, huh. She's like, yeah, sometimes you know, there's like a real great line. You just like want to get it recorded. So the movie thing actually really hit home finally. Uh, when I was in Bernalillo at one of the fortune cookie um, the Powerball fortune cookie places. And uh, I thought this fortune, which was do or do not, there is no try. I don't know if you guys recognize it, but as soon as I got it, I was like, oh my God, that's from The Empire Strikes Back. That is when Lou Skywalker is training with on Dagobah in the misrouted things of Dagobah. And I was like, whoa, that's really weird. Um, and it just hit me, like, God, like Yoda is our new Confucius, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they're very similar. They wear like robes that are similar. And that, in a way, what's in a fortune cookie is just Western wisdom recycled for an American audience. And the Chinese just play the middleman. And that is sort of the, that's the end of my presentation, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> So, I actually, I mean, I have all kinds of props if you guys ever need. This is a textbook, you know, restaurant English. And I also have samples of the Japanese fortune cookies, if anyone ever wants to see them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it happens quite, not infrequently. These numbers are quite popular. Anyway. Can I have time for some questions and will you repeat them back? Yes, I will repeat the questions back. Sure, woman in the blue shirt. Yes, Caribbean Chinese food. No. Yeah, it adapts to the place that um, Chinese food is less a, a, a set of recipes than it is a sort of a philosophy, right? And you chop things up, you use a lot of soy sauce and garlic, ginger, and it adapts everywhere. I mean, there is Peruvian Chinese food, Indian Chinese food, Korean Chinese food. Um, Mexican Chinese food, if you go across the border to a city called Mexicali, 100 or like 200 Chinese restaurants there. And they serve like Mexican Chinese food. Like with a, instead of getting those little crispy noodles, they give you like little tortillas, right? <laughs> and, and, and part of it, 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 what's really interesting to me is I kind of travel the world looking for the greatest Chinese restaurant is that every country has homogenized around a different set of standards, right? So here it's General's House Chicken and Beef with Broccoli and Fortune Cookies. And if you go to, um, France, they have salt and pepper frog legs because that's what French people eat, right? Or if you go to the Caribbean, they actually have a lot of chop suey, um, which is interesting because like we've exported chop suey now to places like Trinidad and Jamaica and India. One of the most popular dishes in Indian Chinese food is actually Amer quote, called, quote, American chop suey and it's made with ketchup. It's bright red, yeah, it's very red. Google it, it's very strange. And, um, and so what's really interesting to me is I went to Korea and they have a chain, I love this, of American Chinese restaurants in Korea, which is sort of like our version of, it's, it's like kind of upscale, so it would be something like Cheesecake Factory, you know, not, I mean, it's, it's kind of a little bit fancy. And I asked a guy, I'm like, do you think your food is authentic? And he, the owner is, um, I'm Chinese American, he's Korean American, so exactly, born in America, but genetically wherever from somewhere else. And he had gone back to open this chain, and it's, it's really popular. The logo is a panda, whatever. Um, and he, he said, he's like, yeah, I think it's, it's authentic American Chinese food. And so American Chinese food is, is its own thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's its own thing. You know, they had like, you know, General Tao's chicken. They had beef with broccoli. They had chow mein. You know, and it was, it, it, authenticity in my world is a function of time and place, right? My, my friends come here and they see General Tao's chicken and they're like, is this edible? Like, it, it really is strange to them because it's like, why is it so deeply fried? And why is it so goopy? And why is it sort of radioactive orange? Like, that's not <laughs> normal. <laughs> but, um, so the answer is that it, it's, it's, it's adapted. And also partially, I think it's adapted very well because different parts of China map to different parts of the world. So if you are from Ch in America, you're most likely Toy San or you're from Fuzhou and you know a couple of Hong Kong and Taiwan type people thrown in like me. If you're from France, you're from Wenzhou. If you're from India, you're probably Hakka. If you're from, from Thailand, you're from Chaozhou. If you're from Korea, if you're in Korea, you're probably from Shandong province, right? So, so the, the, the way that people immigrate in China and probably elsewhere is like, you know, your it's where your neighbor goes, it's where your uncle goes. And so the networks there allow them to sort of homogenize. And what my sort of you know, big epiphany, again, not academically rigorous, but I kind of clever sleight of hand, is um, we are always impressed with McDonald's because like, wow, they standardized the menu and the decor and the dining experience after World War II. I would argue Chinese restaurants have done largely the same thing without a centralized headquarters and without advertising, right? And they managed to do it in part um, through a, a very flattened kind of network where innovations like General Tao's Chicken or Fortune Cookies can spread. And the way I like to say it is like, well, if we think of, you know, McDonald's as Microsoft, then you can think of the Chinese restaurants as Linux, right, open source, where like a good idea can sort of just pass along. And I mean, different ideas have, have come along through Chinese restaurants, like delivery was actually sparked by a woman who's probably now 65, grandmother hanging out, of, she has double mullet from what I, what I remember, uh, she, she is a woman who's like, you know, my customers aren't coming to me in like 1970s New York City. 
so I will bring food to them. And that idea caught on not just with her, but then all Chinese restaurants and after Chinese restaurants, like in order of restaurants in terms of distance away from China. So then like the Thai restaurants and the Japanese restaurants and the Indian restaurants. And now everyone delivers basically. But it was like she sort of had this insight and then this, the system kind of propagates it. So anyway, so I will say Caribbean Chinese food in my world, a little bit weird, but to a lot of people, very comfort foodish, right? And actually in What's really interesting is if you go to Silicon Valley, lots of Indian people, a lot of Indian Chinese restaurants. And to them, it's more a taste of home than Indian food. Because Indian food, they can cook wherever they go, right? Like, okay, we arrived in America, we go to an Indian grocery store and we buy groceries and we cook Indian food at home. Chinese food is not something they can make at home. So to them, when they eat Indian Chinese food, they think of Mumbai or they think, think of Calcutta because they can't get that elsewhere. And I think it's really weird that Chinese food is a taste of home, right? So, yes. Yes, Chinese people love spam. Actually, you know who really loves spam? The Koreans. Koreans really, really love spam. Like you will, you can get like a silk-lined um, gift packet of ten spam. <laughs> and and it's and Korea outside of America is actually the second largest like spam consumer. You know, I'm sure they're much higher than us per capita. But the reason is because in their mind, spam was you know after World War II was something that was very um, rare, right? Because it was meat. And so in their culture, spam is valuable and precious. And so it's all, it's all kind of relative, right? What you think of food is very much an association of like how you grew up and how it was presented to you. Yes? Can you share with us uh, what your mother would have served you as a child, breakfast, lunch, dinner? Uh, so by breakfast came along, we had bagels. But I mean, I, I understand your point. I understand your point. I understand. <laughs> So dinner, I mean, basically my mom cooked a, with a lot of weird things that now looking back makes sense, right? So a lot of dried mushrooms, funguses of all things, um, like little red nutty beady things. So basically the idea is um, the difference between Chinese food for Chinese people and Chinese food Americans is that Chinese food, oh, sorry, Americans don't like to be reminded that their food ever breathed or swam or walked or flew, right? So nothing on this plate should remind you that it was once an animal, so no eyeballs no claws, no ears, no stomach, you know, anything like that. Whereas Chinese people are like all into that. They're like, it's totally fine, bring it on. And, um, and, and partially because they think that the meat that's closest to the bone is the most tender, right? They're like, what? why do you guys like chicken breast? There's no flavor in the chicken breast. And so one of the interesting byproducts of this and so, okay, so Americans don't like things that have animal parts in them, Chinese people do. So perfect arbitrage opportunity. One of the largest illegal imports into China by volume, so not by value, but by volume, after cars, is animal parts. So basically, literally slow boats to China, people pack up these animal parts in, on ice and through Hong Kong go up the river. And I talked to some customs guy and he's like, yeah, it totally goes up like right before um, the new year. Because the Chinese people, there is a demand for like, you know, chicken feet and chicken legs and that there, that there isn't in the West. So people profit and then they have these accidents, actually sometimes the boats, because they're so heavy, like, get beached and they spill animal parts all over. Uh, it's really weird. It's like Exxon Valdez, but like not really. <laughs> like miniature Exxon Valdez, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, the letter eight, I tried to research that. I couldn't find out any reason why that would be your middle initial or name. Right. Okay. And the other item is, how did you find out about the uh, Seinfeld and Friends show uh, when you drove over to Europe and the apartment? Right, okay. So uh, the question is my middle number. So it is number eight. Chinese people are obsessed with the number eight. Uh, Olympics this year starts 8 p.m. August 8th, 2008. They really, really wanted this Olympics because it would not have worked in 2020, for example. Um, but it's like a, so it's a good luck thing. And one of the interesting things is actually in China, you can buy cell phone numbers that end in a lot of eight. So I met a guy, paid 35,000, maybe 35,000 to have a cell phone number that ended in a whole bunch of eights. And that would seem kind of stupid from our perspective, but but the whole idea is when people call him, they can tell he's a man who can afford a cell phone number with five eights. It's sort of like a Prada purse. A Prada purse does not work better than a normal purse, but if you see a woman with a Prada purse, you're like, she's a woman who can afford a Prada purse. And so the the idea of having things with eights in them, like a you know like a driver, a, what do you call it, license plate or a cell phone number, is 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 kind of seen as a mark of prestige, 
in Chinese culture. So, you know, Jennifer Lee, John Smith of Asian American Names, my parents are absolutely brilliant in, in taking the most popular name for girls in the 1970s and pairing it with like Lee, which is like the most generic last name ever. And so as I got into junior high and my, I started you know, sending out applications, because when, when you're little, you don't interact with the, you know, the rest of the world. You might be like Jennifer, you know, there's another Jennifer, there's a Jennifer R, and you'd be Jennifer L. Like, that was the extent of your interaction with the rest of the world. As soon as you get older, you do interact with the rest of the world. And then just parts of my applications were getting split up, and, you know, and there was one really smart girl from, who ultimately went to Cornell, whose name was also Jennifer Lee, and all of our things always got mixed up, whenever because we would apply to the same, like, summer programs. So that's basically it. And sometimes people are like, well, why is there a period? I'm like, it's not a period, it's a decimal point. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and your other question was, um, Right, okay, so he's bringing up something that, you know, because 20 minute presentation. So, you guys know this Chinese takeout boxes? Yeah, so white takeout boxes, which we in America look at and think, wow, symbol of China, to the point that when FedEx started delivering to China, they made their ads featured a little takeout box with a FedEx lo logo on it. The deal is, these things are so American that Canadians don't even use them. They're, they, they've tried to break into the Canadian market. They do not, <laughs> the Canadians don't want them. They're a quote, aluminum and styrofoam market, as I was told. So the deal is these, these um, containers are actually invented in America, originally invented to hold shucked oysters, and then at a certain point, again, adapted by Chinese en masse, because they, they can hold um, things, uh, they can hold hot liquids cheaply, right, because it's one piece. And so what he's bringing up is this idea that we look at these things and think, oh, these are like Chinese, but the rest of the world looks at them because they only see them in a couple places television, basically Friends, Seinfeld, Sex in the City. And they're like, America, right? Because that's the only time they see these kinds of boxes. So the, this company that I, that I went to called Foldpack, which makes about 60 to 70% of all the takeout boxes, um, the, the guy says, yeah, we get these calls from like the Netherlands and South Africa for people who want to buy these boxes because they think they're cool because they're like American. And the interesting thing also about these boxes is like totally random. On the East Coast and the West Coast, they're designed differently, even by the same company. So East Coast, the wire always runs along the short side. West Coast, they run along the long side. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. And in Houston, they only mix in Houston. So you can look at a box and, and note if it's from, um, like, you know, L.A. or New York or whatever. And this, this came up in one, one, one tiny place in my life. Um, there's a movie called Thank You for Smoking, and they're... Uh, Aaron Eckhart, I think, opens his fridge and he has all these takeout containers, right? Because the, the whole idea is it not only symbolizes Chineseness, but it also symbolizes a sort of very hairy lifestyle, like a pathetic lifestyle. And I looked inside and all the boxes, he's supposed to be in DC as a lobbyist, but all the boxes were West Coast boxes. I was like, aha! <laughs> you know, it's like one of those, like, you know, like bloopers, like very subtle bloopers that you would put on some obscure website, but I never did it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, basically, go up. Uh, Rock. So Rockville. Pi you know, I, I know. I my GPS machine tells me where to go because I programmed it in. But the best um, dim sum place. It's called I think New Fortune, and it's in is Gaithersburg in Maryland. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's in Maryland. It's called New Fortune. They have great dim sum. When I had my birthday party here a couple years ago. I catered it all from New Fortune. I think it's New Fortune. Because they, they often have like Chinese names and English names that don't match, so it just kind of tosses us. But basically, stay away from Chinatown. That's sort of, that's like the story. Oh, a total random story. You guys will appreciate this since you're from Washington. You guys know Chinatown Bus, yes? Yeah, yeah. Chinatown Bus started as a way to move Chinatown restaurant workers from New York, New York City outwards. And then like the Lonely Planet crowd found it. So Chinatown bus not only goes to Washington, Boston, and Philly, it goes anywhere east of the Mississippi. I took Chinatown bus to Minnesota, Minneapolis. I can even take it to uh, Wausau, like Wisconsin. You can take it to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And it's funny because the thing is, remember these Chinese restaurant workers are not very literate. I mean, they're not educated even by Chinese standards. So like once they get here, it's like a disaster. So if you can't read and write English, how do you divide up America and the way they do it is through area codes. So you know, I can take you, know, you can take a bus. So the buses are like you know they kind of say like oh it's you know Wisconsin, but like more importantly they'll instead of saying Atlanta they'll say 404 or 770, which are the two area codes that match to Wisconsin, you know Atlanta, and and that's how you you know like you can describe a job in a Chinese restaurant in three ways. There's only three numbers will tell you everything you need to know: how much it pays, how many hours by bus is it from New York City, and what the area code is it in. And that's just, those are the X, Y, and Z of knowing whether or not you want to take a job, basically. Yeah, anyway.
Bye. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.